I guess I will introduce everyone. Um, no, hello, no. good morning. Oh, Todd, are we good? Yep, you're going to go okay. ahead and do housekeeping. Go, go right ahead. All right. So welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. Um, today's topic is Massachusetts Clean Peak Standard, and it's being brought to you by the Clean Energy States Alliance, Sandia National Labs, and the U.S. Department of Energy. Today's topic is Massachusetts Clean Peak Standard, how it will affect renewable and battery storage value streams, projects, and markets. And so to start us off today, I'm just going to go over some webinar logistics. Um, first of all, you all have a choice of how you're listening to this. You can use your computer's mic and speakers, or you can dial in by telephone. You can connect the method you like here. You are all muted, so we will not be able to hear you, but we do encourage you to listen attentively and uh, ask any questions that you may have by printing them into the question box here and hitting send. If this webinar console box is in your way for seeing the slides, you can make it disappear by clicking on this orange and white uh, box here, and that will scoot the console to the side. And if you want to expand it again, click on the arrow and it'll come back. Again, please submit questions as you think of them throughout the broadcast, and our moderator will queue those up and we'll get to as many as we can um, at the end of the presentations today. This webinar is being recorded and we will send you an email with the recording link within one week. Um, Samantha Donalds, our usual uh, webinar wizard is on vacation this week. So as soon as she gets back, she'll be posting out the email, the follow on email to this with the link to the slides and today's webinar recording. So we have a lot to cover today in an hour. So with that, I'm gonna pass this off to Todd Alinsky-Paul, who's the Senior Project Director with the Clean Energy States Alliance. Todd, please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks, Maria, and welcome everybody to another in our series of STAP Energy Storage webinars. Uh, I will do a brief introduction of the program, and then I will introduce the speakers. Um, we have three excellent speakers and a lot of information to share today, and we will get to as many questions as we can. In order to facilitate that, I would invite everyone to type the questions in as, as they occur to you, during the presentation. Don't wait until the end and then try to enter all your questions because um, it will be harder for me to uh, sort through them that way if they all come in at the very end. Uh, so again, welcome. This is one of a series of webinars in our Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership Program webinar series. Uh, STAP is funded by US DOE Office of Electricity through a contract between CESA and Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, the purpose of the STEP program is to support and facilitate energy storage development and deployment. Uh, we have several key activities that we, we are engaged in. We facilitate partnerships between DOE, the national labs, state energy agencies, or sometimes municipal energy agencies, and uh, utilities and, and private sector firms. And those partnerships are specifically to deploy large-scale energy storage projects. And if you look at the map, uh, you can see a number of the projects we've been involved with. They're all over the, all over the United States. Uh, we also disseminate information on energy storage through webinars such as this one, conferences, um, information updates, and so forth. And we support state energy storage efforts with technical policy and program assistance, uh, helping state clean energy agencies to develop energy storage programs and policy and helping state regulators to uh, incorporate energy storage into their energy regulation. Next slide, please, Maria. Uh, I want to say a brief word about Clean Energy States Alliance. Uh, we are a nonprofit located in Vermont. You can see on the screen a, a whole bunch of state energy agency logos. These are the CESA members. It's a membership, agent, uh, membership organization for uh, state clean energy funds and programs such as the ones you see on your screen. Next slide, please. And before we introduce our speakers for today, I would like to thank Dr. Imri Yuk, Director of the Energy Storage Research Program at the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity, who uh, supports this program and many other energy storage efforts around the world and around the country. 
And also, I would like to thank Dan Borneo, Engineering Project and Program Lead at Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, today's speakers. We have three speakers um, who are going to share, I believe, the, the single slide deck. And so I'll let them identify who's speaking as they come in and out of the presentation. But I'll give you a little bit of background on them. We have Mike Berlinski, Director for Emerging Technology at Customized Energy Solutions. Mike joined CES in 2014 in the Emerging Technologies Group. Previously, he was manager of regulatory affairs and a leading energy storage, storage developer and was very active in promoting rules to enhance market opportunities for storage resources. He holds a master's of science and technology and policy from MIT and a bachelor's degree in physics from Wesleyan University. Also from Customized Energy Solutions, we have Nihal Divkar. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If I'm not, I do apologize. Uh, he is manager for Future Grids at CES. He joined in 2018 with a focus on emerging technologies, energy storage, and distributed energy resources. Prior to joining CES, he worked with large multinational uh, EPC consulting and technology companies. He holds a uh, BE and an MS in electrical engineering from Pune University and Oklahoma State University. Then we have Jim Kennerly, a senior consultant at Sustainable Energy Advantage. Uh, he leads the company's public policy analytics practice and co-leads its distributed energy analytics practice. Uh, prior to joining SDA, he worked at the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center at North Carolina State University and the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association and at ICF International. He has a Master's of Public Affairs from Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and a Bachelor of Arts in Politics with honors from Oberlin College. And so that uh, is uh, a very impressive roster of speakers. I'm now going to pass the microphone over to our speakers. And again, uh, please type in the questions as you think about them and we will get to as many as we can after the presentation is over. Great, thank you, Todd. This is Mike Berlinski with Customized Energy Solutions. Thank you, uh, both Todd and Maria, uh, for helping us uh, present here, and uh, thank you to the Clean Energy Group and Clean Energy States Alliance uh, for hosting us. So we're very happy, uh, those of us at Customized Energy Solutions, to be joined by our friends at Sustainable Energy Advantage uh, to share our knowledge about the Massachusetts uh, Clean Peak Energy Standard. So uh, I'll quickly go through the agenda. Uh, we want to give a background introduction on CES and SEA so you know who we are, where we come from. I'll give a little background on the Clean Peak Standard, and then we'll share some uh, analysis uh, about some of the eligible resources in the standard, uh, specifically energy storage and renewables. And then we'll talk a little bit, uh, provide our comments about uh, best practices for a Clean Peak Standard uh, as it uh, may interest other states outside of Massachusetts, and then we'll make sure to have some time for questions and answers. So first, a little bit about Customized Energy Solutions. We're a consulting and services company. Uh, we've been around since 1998, and we help our clients uh, understand and participate in the wholesale and retail electricity and natural gas markets. Uh, we do this uh, around the world, uh, our countries of focus, are United States, Canada, India, Japan, and Mexico. At uh, CES, we have a number of different uh, groups or business lines. Uh, Nehal and I are in the future grid uh, group in the middle. I'm in the emerging technologies group, uh, and we help uh, clients uh, understand the market opportunities for energy storage resources. Uh, some other uh, groups uh, include uh, market intelligence to the right uh, that have folks sit in every single ISO stakeholder meeting and uh, help clients stay on top of the important market developments in those areas. We have our wholesale services group uh, that provides scheduling services for over 11,000 megawatts on behalf of their owners in all of the U.S. and Canadian ISO markets. Uh, those technologies include uh, fossil, renewable, uh, load, and DR, 
uh, as well as over 300 megawatts of newer technology energy storage, uh, that's flywheels and batteries. And so that is the largest third party portfolio uh, of uh, energy storage uh, in the North American wholesale electricity markets. And for retail services, we provide uh, back office uh, support services for competitive energy suppliers. And we help uh, renewable energy uh, companies uh, with RPS management uh, and rec optimization. Uh, we've uh, supported uh, the state of Massachusetts a number of times in the energy storage initiative with the state of charge report, uh, with MassCEC uh, on solar and storage for manufacturing, um, and uh, on the Clean Peak uh, standard. And now I'll let uh, Jim talk a little bit about sustainable energy advantage. Great, thanks, Mike. Yeah, this is uh, Jim Kennerly from uh, Sustainable Energy Advantage. Uh, hope you all have a nice afternoon. Um, yeah, just to real, just to touch on us really quick. Uh, our focus, um, unlike CES, is a little more uh, specific and narrow to uh, renewable energy and uh, specifically Class One renewable energy. And most of that focus is on the Northeast. Um, in terms of uh, various states and programs we've worked in, we've uh, been extensively involved in the development of the uh, Clean Energy Standard in New York. Uh, the a smart program in Massachusetts and, uh, you know, renewable portfolio standard policies throughout the region. Um, we have a number of different uh, uh, subscription services, which I won't get into now, but uh, as far as the, uh, the the Clean Peak Energy Standard, we were the, the prime contractor to uh, DER in uh, supporting development of that program. Great. Thanks, Jim. Thank you much. Great. So I'll uh, share a little bit now about the uh, background on the uh, Clean Peak Standard Program. We'll see if I can uh, advance the slides here. Okay, great. So for the program, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the main uh, goals were threefold. It was to uh, reduce peak electricity demand, cut emissions, and lower ratepayer cost. Uh, it's understood that uh, much of the cost and emissions come from peak periods. So if you look at the graph on the upper right, you'll see uh, an expected typical week. Uh, this is in the win winter in a future year. And you see that normally, uh, without uh, other uh, policies or incentives, there is not expected to be a lot of renewable energy generation during the peak periods, which is likely to happen uh, in the late afternoon period. So the idea for the Clean Peak Standard was to shift uh, this renewable energy uh, from uh, the more off-peak to the more on-peak period. And this can happen uh, through the use of energy storage uh, or other activities. And the idea was to create uh, some incentives to help achieve this. So the design of the Massachusetts Clean Peak Standard I would say it's kind of like a RPS, a renewable portfolio standard, um, but it is different. Uh, I would say it is more complex, uh, and we'll get into the details on the following slides. I won't go into too much of the history, uh, but it's important to note that this has uh, been a multi-year uh, process. Uh, it did start with uh, legislation, um, and the Act to Advance Clean Energy uh, was signed uh, into law in August of 2018. So it's important to note that there are some statutory requirements uh, from uh, that law, uh, and then DOER was given authority uh, to um, uh, fill out the rest of the details and design the rest of the program. So they engaged stakeholders over the last couple years uh, with requesting comments. Um, there have been multiple versions uh, of the regulations. Uh, they hired some uh, consultants, that was us in the SCA, uh, and uh, the program uh, started uh, officially just last month in August. So I would say it is now live. There are still some details uh, still being worked out, um, but uh, there was some uh, state uh, announcement uh, about the launch of this program. Uh, many of the systems are up and running. Some of the systems are still uh, getting uh, up and running. Um, but in general, this year uh, and, and this summer, uh, the program has launched. Um, it is important to note that there are guidelines uh, out for comment uh, on things like resource eligibility 
uh, and the load uh, that uh, would be exempt from this uh, program. So that uh, those details are still being worked on. So now for the next couple slides, I'll talk about some of the details of this. <clears throat> so one important design goal was to limit the cost to ratepayers, and, and the idea was less than uh, half a cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, and you can look at the DOER uh, website and the consultant team analysis on the Clean Peak Standard website uh, for some information around that. So the program uh, focuses on uh, different seasonal uh, four-hour windows uh, that um, vary on a day-to-day -day, uh, and season-to-season -season basis. On the table in the upper right, you can see the four different seasons uh, and when they are and what the peak period is, and generally it's a late afternoon period. For the uh, demand, uh, each uh, load serving entity must meet a certain percentage of its electricity uh, with uh, this clean peak energy. And so the, the target uh, unit is in um, energy and kilowatt hours. It is not a uh, peak uh, megawatt metric, but rather uh, a volumetric uh, energy or kilowatt hours uh, basis. So in that sense, it's similar to a renewable portfolio standard, uh, but being a clean peak program, uh, it is significantly different from an RPS as well. So the demand uh, for this year is 1.5% uh, of the eligible retail sales uh, and those uh, that are contracted or happen after a certain date. It is important to note that municipal light plants are exempt uh, from this program. Now, the, uh, the demand will increase uh, every year, and the graph in the lower right uh, shows that expected demand uh, through the end of the program, through 2050. Uh, it's important to note that uh, banking uh, is uh, is possible uh, up to a certain amount uh, for up to a certain period. And now uh, long-term procurement by the uh, electric distribution uh, companies or EDCs uh, is uh, part of this program. And the idea is to procure uh, or contract uh, for at least 30% uh, of those entities' uh, obligations. Now, there, there are no details about those procurements uh, yet, but I, I would uh, expect that uh, in the near future. So now some more details. This will focus on the supply side. So this is really targeting uh, Massachusetts-based uh, or Massachusetts-focused uh, resources. So a resource could be located outside of Massachusetts if it's contracted to serve load in Massachusetts. Uh, it's focused on a couple different technologies, uh, renewables, uh, storage, uh, and demand response, uh, or load-sided resources. And there's really, uh, I would say, four different uh, categories or buckets. So the first is new renewable resources uh, that are online, a commercial online date uh, after January 1st, 2019. Existing renewables that went online before that date are eligible uh, if they have co-located with a qualified energy storage system or QESS, uh, and that resource must meet certain uh, capacity and duration requirements. Now for a standalone uh, storage system or QESS, it has to be new and uh, it has to primarily charge uh, with renewable energy. And there's four ways uh, to meet that requirement. Uh, it can co-locate with a renewable resource. It can have a contract with a renewable resource. Uh, it can charge during typically high renewable energy periods. And the table in the lower right will show that if you plan to charge with wind energy, you should charge during this window. And if you plan to charge with solar energy, you should charge during that window. Or to have an operational schedule in the ISA, that's Interconnection Service uh, Agreement, uh, to show that you resolve a uh, type of power issue. Uh, so those are the four ways that a uh, QESS can prove uh, that it's gonna charge from renewables. And also uh, demand response, uh, or customer cited resources. Now, explicitly generators are ineligible. So uh, a backup generator, a diesel generator uh, are not eligible uh, in this program, uh, but a storage resource uh, behind a retail meter or uh, electric vehicle uh, system uh, is eligible. And it, and it has been noted that active demand response programs are okay. Uh, for example, connected solutions, uh, which is a very popular DR program uh, in Massachusetts and other states. So it has been uh, stated that it is possible to uh, stack the revenues from the Clean Peak Standard and other DR programs 
uh, such as those with the utilities or the ISO. And so lastly, I'll talk about some of the other uh, pieces of this program. So there are multipliers which will adjust the amount of uh, Clean Peak Energy certificates uh, that a uh, megawatt hour uh, of energy during this peak period uh, will uh, be assigned. Uh, these multipliers are meant to uh, try and get the, the right uh, attributes, the right impact, or the right behavior, uh, or incentivize the right type of resources uh, for this program. So first, on a seasonal basis, there is a four times multiplier uh, to, to get four times the uh, credits for one megawatt hour of energy uh, if that uh, energy is generated or the load is reduced during the summer or winter seasons. For the monthly uh, system peak hour, uh, that is a very high multiplier of 25 times. If that unit of energy uh, or load reduction happens uh, during that uh, monthly uh, peak hour. For uh, uh, resource qualified for uh, resilience uh, to help uh, avoid a blackout or, or ride through a blackout, uh, there is a one and a half multiplier, so that's also greater than one. Uh, for some types of resources, the multiplier is less than one. So for an existing resource, uh, if it's a renewable resource that came online before uh, the cutoff date, uh, that will have one tenth. For a resource that is contracted with another program uh, like SMART uh, or the 83. 83C uh, wind, offshore wind procurement, uh, that will have one one hundredth. Uh, and for a storage resource, for an energy storage or ES resource uh, that is in the SMART program, uh, that will have a three tenths uh, multiplier. Again, that is for purposes of calculating the number of credits uh, for that unit of, uh, uh, of energy um, that is going to um, uh, be counted during the peak window. So uh, it's important to note that the certificate price uh, will be based on uh, market forces. Um, so it, it, one of the big drivers is going to be the tension between uh, demand and supply. And is there uh, a large amount of demand relative to supply or uh, vice versa? There is an alternative compliance payment or ACP. And the graph on the right will show the uh, starting or expected price for the ACP, it starts out at uh, $45 and it uh, declines over time. Uh, and that can be in, you can call it in units of uh, dollar per credit or uh, dollar per uh, adjusted megawatt hour uh, or dollar per uh, clean peak energy certificate. So there's a couple different units you might hear, uh, but the idea is that that is that value of the ACP. Uh, and then the, um, the actual market price uh, can be up to that. Uh, there is uh, annual compliance reporting uh, requirement. There are some uh, metering requirements spelled out in the regulations. Uh, DOER has certain levers to adjust some of the program parameters. They're going to be based on the supply demand tension. Uh, this is, for example, the demand uh, of the program or, or the value of the ACP. Those can be adjusted uh, if conditions warrant. And then there is a program review uh, built in. Right now, that's about every four years, you can expect a wholesale review of the program, uh, possibility that, that some other parameters uh, will be adjusted. So that's it for the background. I'm happy to uh, take questions at the end about that. But now I want to turn over to some initial analysis uh, for this. So I'll turn first uh, to my colleague, Nehal, to talk about uh, storage. Thanks, Mike. Uh, hi, my name is Nehal, and I'm with uh, CES, Customized Energy Solutions, uh, and I shall cover uh, the next few slides on this topic. Um, Thank you. Uh, so earlier in the presentation, we looked at uh, the eligible supply side resources for the Clean Peak standard. Uh, We'll notice how energy storage itself uh, holds a place of prominence from amongst uh, the set of qualified technologies as uh, storage can be paired with an existing renewable resource uh, or a new uh, renewable resource. Storage could be standalone resource with certain 
uh, virtual pairing or charging restrictions. And ultimately, uh, it could be uh, also be a part of demand response, uh, as Mike just mentioned a little while ago. Uh, the key attribute for storage really is the ability uh, to dispatch the resource and therefore uh, play an effective role in shifting clean energy to, to times of peak demand, which is itself is the underlying goal on which uh, this program was built. Uh, to participate in the Clean Peak standard and earn Clean Peak certificates, uh, energy store resources can continue to uh, provide a variety of services uh, to the wholesale energy market. Uh, resources simply need to meter and report 15-minute uh, interval performance uh, in compliance with uh, standards and protocols uh, that are developed and applicable to the program. Uh, but through this, uh, depending on the outlook and expectations from prices of clean peak energy certificates, and also as a part uh, of larger market participation strategy, uh, storage asset owners can elect to employ a variety of approaches uh, to benefit from the program, such as prioritizing uh, over only uh, prioritizing in CPS only over a certain part of the year. Uh, when say seasonal multipliers are the highest such as in summer and winter or uh, something like targeting the monthly system peak uh, which itself brings a very high multiplier and uh, uh, towards uh, maximizing additional revenues uh, uh, from the program in the next slide uh, what we we'll do is we'll look at some of the dispatch patterns uh, some sample dispatch patterns uh, that can emerge when employing such uh, potential strategies Uh, so here we look at uh, typical dispatch charts uh, of uh, or a dispatch profile for a prototypical one megawatt, one megawatt hour, one hour uh, storage resource uh, located in Massachusetts. Uh, strategy one uh, reflected in the chart to the left of the slide. Uh, this indicates uh, prioritization of market revenues over targeted participation in the CPS but does include adding back uh, of, uh, of accumulated uh, incremental revenues from uh, generated clean peak certificates. So this, this is a dispatch chart, doesn't reflect any dollar figures, but uh, just want to emphasize that in dispatch strategy one, we're still benefiting from the program, but in a different way. Uh, in strategy two, which is to the right, uh, it indicates prioritization of uh, clean peak energy certificate generation along with market revenues. And this is at an assumed uh, CPEC, a certificate price of $45, uh, which also happens to be the cap on the alternative compliance payment. Uh, this analysis is based on CSS uh, proprietary model for storage dispatch called Comets, which is competitive market evaluation tool for storage. You'll notice that the daily clean peak windows are uh, highlighted with dot, dotted ovals. And uh, in strategy two, uh, to the right, the model schedules the storage resource for energy services or uh, day ahead uh, market energy discharge specifically much more uh, than it does in case of strategy one. Uh, in doing so, the model also uh, charges back from the real-time market during uh, hour 12 as it uh, it has deemed it economically still more profitable to do so. Uh, comparing this to strategy one, the model schedules lesser in day ahead market energy and more in other services. Uh, the point I'm trying to uh, expand on here is how different dispatch strategies can be employed uh, by storage assets to target participation uh, in the clean peak standard uh, in line with broader goals and objectives. In the next slide, we will look at the range of potential contribution uh, the, to revenues that CPS can uh, bring to storage resources. So in continuation of the same strategy that we just looked at, uh, this, this slide now reflects the contribution of uh, revenues from each wholesale uh, market value stream uh, for the two for the two strategies. Uh, again, this is done for the same prototypical resource and analyzing just for a single year of uh, revenues or market participation in the ISO New England wholesale energy market. Uh, you'll notice that uh, a certain category carries a negative uh, uh, sign there, which is simply uh, attributed because those are charging costs and those costs offset uh, the total net revenues that the resource can generate. 
uh, we'll notice that the percentage contribution of incremental revenues from CPS in this uh, case or case study, uh, they, they can range from 8% uh, to 28% going from strategy one to two. So that's a significant swing uh, or a range of revenues that can exist uh, depending on uh, the prices which uh, uh, the, the Clean Peak Energy Certificates can attract. Uh, and the percentage mix uh, here will change year over year as uh, uh, prices for not just for Clean Peak uh, uh, certificates but also other market value streams change. Uh, and therefore, it does underscore uh, the importance of uh, having uh, a suitable view on how these different value streams uh, uh, will vary from a price perspective uh, uh, going year over year. Uh, so uh, that's all I have wanted to cover on the analytical side. Uh, this I'll hand it over to Jim from SEA who will uh, walk us through the next few slides. Great, thank you, Nihal. Trying to get control of the uh, PowerPoint. You should be all set now, Jim. Thanks. There we go. All right. Yep. So uh, again, this is Jim Kiley from Sustainable Energy Advantage. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to go through here is to just talk through uh, from sort of the renewable side and the uh, uh, renewables plus storage side. You know, some illustrative revenue cases uh, on a dollar per megawatt hour basis. So I want to differentiate what I mean by dollar per megawatt hour basis relative to um, some of the the other figures that we saw here. So these this is dollar per megawatt hour of total system production for a renewable energy project. So this is you know this assumes that the projects will earn a certain number of CPECs from their operation, and then um, you know, that would essentially be amortized, for lack of a better word, in terms of an average revenue figure across all of the production of the project. So um, obviously that'll be different depending on whether it's, uh, you know, the, the total production will be different relative to whether it's renewables only or if it's renewables, uh, you know, physically and or virtually paired with storage. So I guess I just want to talk, and I think what this will help do is uh, explain what, uh, we see as sort of the most substantial sectors and the most uh, likely sectors to um, of those that are related to renewable energy to be major near-term contributors uh, to the supply mix for the uh, for the program. So, um, so I guess we'll start. So I'll start with category one. And so this, of course, is new renewables online after January one, twenty nineteen. Um, so the, I think the main um, the main you know beneficiary of of this class of resources in which there's no pairing with qualified energy storage the uh the land based wind projects of which there are not terribly many in Massachusetts uh but there are there are definitely still some uh you know these projects we we would expect that they'd be getting around you know an additional eight dollars a megawatt hour so about a cent per kilowatt hour uh in addition so not an insubstantial sum um but of course, it's un fairly unlikely to influence its operation, just given that um, these these projects are uh, non-dispatchable. Um, however, the contracted resource multiplier, or the contracted resources that include offshore wind and DG solar under the SMART program, uh, we obviously would see this as being pretty unlikely to have any kind of, uh, you know, you know, highly remunerative value, and we, we really see the the importance to you know project viability as being de minimis. We it's it's even possible that the uh, the the utilities, the the electric distribution companies, that's what EDCs means here. Sorry, um, is they may not even attempt to qualify those resources as a means to you know capture the value for ratepayers um on behalf of you know any offshore wind contracts for instance um just given that it's such a small value stream um and that that contracted multiplier just results in so few cpecs uh, i think largely the same is true for uh based on our analysis the largely the same is true for uh the smart program smart projects that are not paired with uh, qualified energy storage so um 
it's a little bit different for projects that are online that were online uh, prior to um, January first, twenty nineteen. So this is going to include a lot of DG storage, uh, sorry, DG Solar uh, paired that um, was online prior to uh, that you know January twenty nineteen date, but then chooses to pair with qualified energy storage. So this includes a fair amount of capacity. I think about two point five gigawatts under the uh, Solar carve out and solar carve out two programs that are popularly known, popularly known as SREC one and two. Um, those will receive an existing multiplier, which is the you know one tenth multiplier. Um, and under the use case that we had here, uh, we assume, we found that that would receive around seventeen dollars a megawatt hour. So it's not a not an insubstantial sum, but just given how much uh, incentive that these projects receive. Um, I think we would we would think that the contribution to the market would be you know material, but perhaps not you know a game changer. I think it certainly would be a bigger a bigger value for uh, projects that uh, could uh, make a demand charge management use case. Uh, but we don't really see that as a big driver across the board. Um, and then um, so for and, and we also would assume that you know it would have material influence on the operation, although it wouldn't again be a game changer of sorts. So we definitely see this as sort of a sort of you know small to mid range you know portion of the potential supply. Land based wind I think is a little somewhat less so. The 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 revenue for that sector is like is, is comparable to for DG Solar, but um and it and it is likely to have. Uh, be valuable uh, as an additional revenue stream uh, and could have pretty significant influence over its operations. This could be one of the categories for which changing the, uh, for adding storage could really, you know, create a much more substantial contribution to peak. Well, and actually, let me just say one more thing about that, which is just, whoops. Just to say one more thing about that, which is that um, obviously land-based winds that exist in Massachusetts again is a, is a, is a smaller sector compared with uh, DG Solar in Massachusetts. So while it's relatively remunerative, it's not a it's not a uh, a large share of a class one supply um, in Massachusetts to begin with, you know, at least relative to what DG Solar is and will be in the near term. So and this is the more sort of interesting category i think that where there's potential for um you know a, a number of different use cases and it, it sort of matches with the you know the cost profile of adding storage in many cases is uh you know projects that get that are kind of a mixture of that new renewables but also pairing with uh qualified energy storage projects so those we consider those sort of the category one projects that mike talked about and category three projects all in one so we would assume that the DG solar projects would get a, um, they would, the, the solar project, the solar capacity itself would get the contracted multiplier, so it would be heavily discounted, but the, the, the storage capacity would get the, the much less uh, punitive, uh, you know, three tenths uh, multiplier. So for that case, uh, when, when it's uh, physically paired, so just these numbers are for a physically paired case, we see that as being about five dollars a megawatt hour. So, um, for the entire you know production of the project, so um, yeah, it's likely to be a fairly significant contributor in the near term, and that's mostly because there's a lot of solar plus storage projects in Massachusetts interconnection queues. Uh, there's some new rules in the Smart Program that require uh, energy storage for all projects over 500 uh, kW, and um, in general, it's we though we we're, we're not entirely certain whether it's going to have a big impact on operations and uh, sort of targeting peak periods. But it's definitely not uh, central to the value proposition of these projects. Part in, in significant part because they are receiving a pretty substantial energy storage adder. So uh, one pretty interesting use case uh, is with. Uh, virtually pairing with offshore wind. So um, obviously Massachusetts has a number of different um, procurements for offshore wind and uh, targets that are uh, currently being debated by the general court to be raised to potentially up to 3,600 megawatts. 
And uh, what we're assuming here is, is that it's, it's possible that uh, even though the offshore wind would receive the contracted multiplier uh, in the near term, or at least you know projects that are contracted in the near term would get that, um, we would assume that any actually paired storage would not uh, receive this reductive multiplier. So virtual pairing is a really interesting concept in this whole uh, this whole program structure. And since um, it's you know we we would assume that there'd be some sharing of the revenue between the solar and the storage resource. Uh, I'm sorry, the offshore wind and the storage resource. And um, a lot of it has to do with exactly how the benefits of these contracts are assessed to ratepayers and you know how they're monetized more broadly. But at the same time, we, we think it could be a pretty significant contributor to uh, the supply curve for the entire um, the market itself. So it, it's definitely pretty interesting. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how um, virtual pairing kind of works out. Like how are those PPAs worked out? How are the revenue sharing arrangements worked out? How are the risks, you know, worn by one party versus the other? So I think that's something we don't really know right now, but there is a lot of potential for kind of collaboration between these large resources, particularly the offshore wind. But just, oops, just want to talk briefly. So where does this all fit in? So I, I think one of the things that we hope to do, uh, you know, in conjunction with CES and just in general, is to understand uh, the uh, the how this market you know fits together and how does price formation really work. So what all I was talking about in, in the previous slides was about you know these various uh, categories of potential supply, but what but what we're really starting to look at here is really how all this works together and how supply and demand are, um, how they will interact to uh, ensure that, you know, that essentially to, to form price and to, to create a, uh, and to help. <laughs> yeah, obviously. So it would be, it would be to uh, ensure that price formation would occur properly. I guess I've never used price formation as a verb. So sorry about that. But, uh, so, um, yeah, and I think what our goal is is just to, to make sure that we understand that supply. I think we've given a little bit of a picture here, but our, our goal here and one of the things that we specialize in as a firm is um, the understanding really how that price formation works, you know, in the renewable projects, in the renewable markets, particularly class one. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to uh, doing a lot of that work um, in the future uh, for uh for clients. So just going to pass it back over to um, Mike. Great. Thanks, Jim. So now I want to close out with uh, some, some comments, um, really focusing on best practices uh, for other states, as, as we know, others are considering uh, a clean peak standard. So first, uh, it's really best to first identify the program goals and uh, then uh, balance uh, cost uh, and value, the, the supplier value and, and the cost of load, uh, as well as uh, the likely or expected benefits uh, that the program uh, is likely to produce. Uh, and, and I think uh, Massachusetts and, and DOER has, has done a good job uh, with uh, considering all these different uh, forces. Um, it is important to be clear on resource eligibility, and, and I would say that this uh, has uh, become clear, uh, has become more clear uh, over time. Certainly with any uh, such new program, there's question as to um, uh, all the different uh, flavors uh, of technology um, and uh, what might um, uh, enable or disqualify uh, a, a type of resource. So I think definitely a lot of attention uh, should be given there. Uh, it's important to identify the revenue gap for those resources and the suppliers, because uh, this will help better uh, get get a handle uh, on the likely project development, uh, the likely supply participation, uh, which is going to drive uh, what benefits are achieved uh, and the and the likely cost to the program. Uh, and I think um, uh, this has been done by DOER early on, uh, and 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 CES and, and SEA, the supporting consultants, uh, did help out on that. I think it's it's really uh, helpful to have levers to adjust certain program parameters uh, as uh, this Clean Peak standard does. 
Um, because uh, the exact uh, forces, supply, demand, uh, balance uh, will not be known, uh, and it's hard to know whether the parameters are set too tight or too loose, uh, and whether uh, the desired outcomes uh, will be achieved. So I think having that um, flexibility is important, uh, and this program uh, does a good job of that. Now, it's, I think it's also important to be clear on who owns uh, these attributes created by the program. I think there's still some uncertainty uh, over this uh, program, even though DOER has been very uh, clear on this. Uh, it seems that from uh, stakeholder comments, uh, there is still uncertainty uh, from, from some folks uh, for, uh, for certain attributes, given all the um, other programs, other uh, contractual uh, status uh, of the likely uh, participants. And then uh, it's important uh, to be uh, clear on the ability for uh, someone to participate in multiple programs. And uh, this is important from all of the program's administrators. So I think DOER has been uh, very clear um, and provided guidance uh, on the ability to participate in Clean Peak Standard uh, and other programs. Uh, but again, from uh, stakeholder comments, there is still lack of clarity uh, whether those other program administrators feel the same way. So I think that's where uh, in other uh, areas, uh, getting all of those program administrators to come together and coordinate uh, and, and issue uh, statements to be uh, explicitly clear uh, of, uh, of what programs you can uh, 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 participate in, uh, what value streams uh, you can stack uh, between the utilities and the ISO. Uh, uh, because that really helps uh, a more uh, clear um, and stable picture for the uh, expected participants. So uh, that's um, the main uh, takeaways and comments there. So now I just want to uh, thank you all and um, on behalf of Customized Energy Solutions and Sustainable uh, Energy Advantage, uh, we're very happy to present this information. We look forward to uh, taking questions. And I just want to give a quick plug uh, as uh, our firms are looking to continue our collaboration uh, on the Clean Peak Standard. Uh, we're offering uh, a two part uh, Clean Peak Standard webinar series. Uh, the first one will happen in early October. Uh, that'll focus on early insights. And then the next one in November uh, that will provide some preliminary uh, market analysis. And this is uh, leading up to launching a new uh, Clean Peak Standard uh, Fundamentals service, um, hopefully around uh, the end of this year. Uh, so thanks for your attention, and uh, we're happy to take some questions. Great, and thank you, uh, Mike, Nehal, and Jim, for a very, very uh, information-packed presentation. We have a lot of questions. Uh, in fact, we've been doing these webinars for many years, and I rarely see this many questions. We have a lot of people on the line. So um, officially, we have 10 minutes left. But um, since you all, you all, the, the speakers have indicated that they can stay a little longer, and we have so many questions, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go a little past two o'clock uh, Eastern time and see if we can get to some of these uh, some very excellent questions that we received so if you've if you've been listening in and um, you have a little uh, you know an extra 10 minutes or so please stay with us we'll, we'll get to as many of these as we can uh, so first of all um, somebody is asking um, with regard to your slides 16 17 and 18 which was that table showing how the different resources are expected to uh, be able to benefit from the program. Um, and the comment is, it looks like only offshore wind paired with uh, storage has a, a significant role to play. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's really the way to interpret this, but that's the question. So, so how much of a role, if that's true, does the Clean Peak Standard have to play overall if, if it's really applying mostly to offshore wind, which is, uh, you know, uh, in its in its infancy, really, in this country. Yeah. Um, so, sure, I'm happy to take that one. Um, yeah, I, I guess I generally, you know, I understand why someone might conclude that from what we've shown here. I think obviously it's 
a more complex picture. I think there's a um, the the program I, in many ways, you know, the more you look at it, is a program that is intended to, you know, boost energy storage and demand response and have those resources in many ways kind of modify the output of renewable energy or the modify the loads of, of certain projects. Um, in Massachusetts, I would say that offshore wind is a huge chunk of the future resource mix. Um, I would say it's going to be the, along with DG Solar, probably the lead actor in kind of serving, you know, or, you know, getting to the point of higher penetrations of renewables. So I'm not sure that that's inconsistent with the picture of the market as a whole. Um, but uh, at the same time, yes, I think that there's, I think that with, with regard to DG solar plus storage, it's going to be a pro, it's going to be a market that is intended to, to complement but not replace the, um, the, the smart, uh, smart program uh, storage adder. So they, these products are getting a fairly substantial adder um, by pairing with energy storage to begin with. Um, I think that there's certainly some interesting uh, potential revenue opportunities for distributed solar projects that pair virtually too with, uh, with those types of storage projects. But um, without a doubt, I think this is going to be a program that uh, is focused on the development of, you know, I don't want to call it new technology because storage is not necessarily technology, but certainly an emerging technology. So. Um, okay. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to actually jump in because I want to try to keep these responses uh, brief, if possible, just given the number of questions that we have. You mentioned virtual pairing. We have a couple of people who are asking, how does virtual pairing work? And what does that mean, to be virtually paired? Yeah, I, I can... Just uh, identify yourself that, when, you, when you speak to. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. This is Mike. Yeah, so as, as the uh, previous slide in the... Um, uh, program details for the supply uh, number 10 uh, shows, um, you don't have to be physically co-located uh, with a, a renewable and a storage resource uh, to be paired. A virtual pairing would be that a resource, uh, a storage resource can charge during a certain time of day, uh, and then it is uh, assumed that it will be primarily charging with renewable energy uh, given the expected volume of renewable energy on the system uh, at that time. So that's one example of how a storage resource can be virtually paired with a renewable resource. Great. Um, yeah. Tom, may I add yeah, did, on? did you want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, uh, I think, I think right now, I think I just want to reiterate something that I said in my initial remarks, which was just that at this point, um, there's not really a clear template like there is for a power purchase agreement for a renewable energy project or a, you know, renewable energy and storage project or just storage project to figure out exactly how the terms would be laid out. I think that these are kind of going to be um, entirely new types of agreements in which, you know, there's not a lot of precedent. And I, but our assumption is, is that that revenue would very likely be shared between the two virtually paired resources. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few questions about ground source heat pumps, which uh, people are saying don't seem to be included, but could be very effective. Um, any Any comments about well, first of all, are are they included, and uh, if not, uh, is there a reason, or is it something that might be, you know, uh, looked at in a, in a program revision at some point? Jim, want to take it? Sure. I I think my understanding is that that is a a resource that could. Um, notionally fall into what's called category four, which is uh, the, the distributed, sorry, the, the demand response and sort of, uh, you know, load flexibility category for the lack of better, lack of better word. We focus mainly on renewables and storage here, I think, because those are in part our, 
our significant, you know, sort of skill sets and our significant background and just given that this is a storage focused webinar. But yes, I think that would, if those resources could be shown to make, you know, targeted contributions to uh, reducing peak during, you know, seasonal peak periods, I, I guess I, I wouldn't be thinking that those would not qualify. I think they would be obviously how they're metered and how they're, how the, you know, measure, you know, measurement and verification are done, I think are kind of open questions, but that would be, um, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's excluded on its face. It's much like EV charging, you know, where EV charging at proper times, you know, you know, and enabling vehicle to grid is actually a sector that's, you know, considered a, will, will be considered likely a uh, substantial contributor to uh, supply. Yeah, thanks. And I will say that some of those uh, demand response uh, types of resources, for example, thermal storage systems uh, are still um, under development. And so uh, th there may be more guidance coming out on, on uh, technologies like ground source heat pumps as well. Great. We have a bunch of questions about uh, sort of benefit stacking and qualifying for more than one program. You did address this to, to, to some degree. Um, but there's a couple of specific questions. So uh, one question, would a renewable resource be able to qualify for the RPS and at the same time for the Clean Peak Standard, or is that somehow mutually exclusive? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. Uh, it is the original uh, draft of the legislation, um, which I think was there, there was a fair amount of pushback from the industry and from, you know, other folks had said that if a CPC was retired that, you know, a rec for the same uh, generation could not be retired. Uh, but that was, I think that that would have created a fair amount of um, awkwardness and uncertainty for a lot of renewable energy projects. And so you actually, so yes, it is a, it is a, you, you can, you know, double dip, dip, dip for lack of a better word, um, in the RPS as well as in the, the CPES. So, uh, and I just wanted to say one more thing just about something I said earlier, um, which was um, the, what we were showing before, uh, as far as, uh, you know, illustrative revenue results, I guess I just thought about one of the questions before that that's not an exhaustive list, I would say of uh, types of projects that would receive value. I think we just wanted to show some of the larger, uh, you know, shares of, you know, projects and the, you know, the, the largest pots of uh, projects that would get that value. Obviously, biomass plants would, would get that kind of value. Class two resources could get that kind of value, um, particularly the existing resources. And I think we just, we mainly were focused on sort of the most uh, substantial near-term drivers. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, another stacking question. This is one I'm interested in, in particular. Um, suppose you have a, a, uh, a facility with a coincident peak. So your your individual facility peak behind your meter is is coinciding with the regional peak demand, and you're and you're using, uh, say, a battery to to engage in demand charge management. Could you then sign up for connected solutions, continue to do demand charge management, and and also get aggregated into a, the Clean Peak program and, and get essentially three different benefit streams from one? Um, and, I, and, I, and I understand this is kind of an extreme example, but, you know, the, the point being, are there any kind of, you know, uh, rules about this kind of thing, or does it just, just sort of whatever you can – cobbled together for a system and however you can qualify it uh, for various programs is is uh, fair game. Yeah, this is Mike. So, so the short answer is yes, you can uh, stack all those uh, value streams. You can uh, reduce a customer's bills. You can participate uh, in a utility demand response uh, program uh, like the Connected Solutions, uh, and you can participate in the Clean Peak Standard uh, with an eligible uh, type of resource uh, and, and, and batteries behind a, a retail meter uh, are eligible in uh, Clean Peak Standard and uh, able to participate 
uh, in connected solutions uh, and, and are, uh, have great uh, track record with uh, lowering customer uh, peak uh, bills. Uh, so yes, the short answer is yes. Great. Okay, we had a couple questions about the ACP, the alter alternative compliance payment. Why does it decline over time? Somebody says, and wouldn't it make more sense for the ACP to increase over time? Yeah, this is my. Right. I'll, I'll take a first cut, and I encourage uh, Nehal and Jim to to jump in. But I would say that it it, it makes sense to decline over time as the uh, revenue gap. Uh, for resources is expected to decline over time uh, so that uh, that value needed to incentivize this type of behavior uh, can decline uh, over time. So, so that would be one reason uh, to have that decline. Now, and Jim, did you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can understand the question just because the, um, the ACP in, you know, a, a number of different regional you know, RPS program does rise uh, at, you know, what's considered a rate of inflation and, uh, or, or just at CPI or, I mean, it's, it's very different based on the resource, but I think that, uh, yeah, I think in general, a lot of the design, a lot of the reason it declined, just literally the reason it was proposed as a decline was a lot, was just the rate payer cost limitation that was uh, discussed uh, you know, Mike discussed it at the, at the outset. And um, so, yeah, and I think just the way that the market supply adjustments can be made also um, under the rules. Um, so the more, essentially the more um, shortage there is, there also is a more, a, a tendency towards um, reduction in ACP. So there's kind of like a double, you know, there can be kind of a double whammy for ACP in some cases, in those cases. But um, yeah, I think a lot of it was just driven by the desire on DOER's part to um, manage the the sort of direct rate payer costs. Well, that, thank you. I'm glad you brought up rate payer costs. We had some questions about whether this program was costing the rate payers. Uh, usually when a, when a state adopts a, a program such as this one, there is some kind of a cost benefit analysis that has to be done. Uh, so I'm assuming that there was one and you could perhaps speak to, uh, how that, you know, cost benefit, um, uh, ratio looks, um, uh, you know, and, and what are the costs and the benefits of the program? Yeah, sure. I, I can give a first cut and then ask uh, Nihal or Jim to, to add more detail. But I will say that, um, yeah, DOA has shown that the program is uh, cost effective and does provide uh, a net benefit uh, overall. Uh, so that is um, uh, an expectation. Uh, Jim, or Nihal, did you want to add more details to that? Sure. Yeah, I I agree with Mike. I, I, I think, the, yes, the report that was done did include uh, those values, uh, and I think DOER, in fact, utilized the model we developed to also come up with some of their own estimates. And yes, it was definitely a net, you know, positive as far as ratepayer costs are concerned. Um, you know, and, but I just want to point out that the um, ACP and the ultimate uh, and several other pieces that drive ratepayer costs were changed substantially throughout the rulemaking. So, you know, the, the estimate that we made originally was, is, is quite different than what likely was, um, was the, very likely quite different than what was adopted. Um, yeah. Okay. But, but can you give some examples or, or, or sort of a broad sketch of what the costs and the benefits look like? I mean, presumably, um, you know, there are benefits associated with, with applying more clean generation to peak periods. And I would assume that has something to do with emissions and something to do with the cost of, of generation at those peak demand times and, and maybe some other things. And then, you know, obviously there's going to be some some cost involved in a in a program of this sort. So can you can you kind of speak to what the the main costs and benefits look like or what they are? 
Yeah, this is Mike. I, I pulled up um, a, 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 a summary of this. Now, this is from last year, and as Jim said, some of the uh, program parameters have changed over time. Uh, but but one of the latest uh, public uh, presentations on this uh, DOER shared um, that there there was expected to be uh, over 700 million dollars of ratepayer savings uh, over the first 10 years, uh, and over 500,000 uh, metric tons of uh, carbon dioxide uh, savings uh, again over that same period. So so initially there will be uh, out of pocket uh, cost of uh, maybe about a billion dollars. There'll be savings of almost $2 billion. Uh, and therefore, uh, sorry, and and therefore uh, savings of um, almost a billion dollars over a 10 year period, uh, as well as emissions, significant emission savings uh, over the whole uh, period. So uh, again, after the first initial years um, where it may be closer uh, over the subsequent years, and again, over that whole initial period of, of say 10 years or so, there is expected to be significant uh, cost and emission savings. Great, well, that brings up another question. Uh, so when we talk about peaks uh, in terms of uh, electricity, we're often talking about demand peaks, uh, but there are different kinds of peaks, right? So there's demand peaks when, when there's the most being demanded uh, in terms of, of you know consumers looking to to purchase electricity from the grid. Then there are cost peaks where it's it's the most expensive and there are emissions peaks. So I wonder how well those line up. And when you did the analysis, I imagine that's one of the things that you would be looking at is, you know, if you're targeting peak demand times, does that mean you're targeting peak emissions as well and peak cost or how does that, how do those line up? Yeah, thanks for that. So definitely, uh, DOER and 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 the consulting team did did lots of analysis on uh, those uh, cost uh, profiles in terms of uh, peak demand, um, the, the cost of electricity uh, over the course of a day, and the uh, emissions uh, of the system of the electric system uh, over the course of the day. Now there, there's lots of lots of ways to slice and dice the data and uh, different historical periods. Uh, weather uh, can drive that. Uh, as different uh, resources come and go and, and different policies uh, change, uh, that can all change. Uh, but uh, the, the whole team did, did lots of analysis over lots of different sample data. Um, and I would say that the, the, the graph that I had put up in the early uh, part around slide eight is definitely representative in terms of um, the, uh, the, the demand profile uh, can look like that at that period. Uh, the, the cost profile uh, is not too dissimilar in terms of uh, when there's a, a peak uh, electricity uh, demand, whether it be in the summer or the winter, uh, then, then the cost uh, to, to meet that demand uh, will also peak. Um, and, and often, uh, because of the generation called on to meet the peak, uh, then the relative emissions uh, can go up. So, so yes, there, there is a lot of profiles that have been made available. Uh, through uh, through presentations uh, by DOER and the consulting team, um, and so folks can see that and see how those profiles vary over the course of a day uh, or a season uh, and, and over the horizon. Jim or Nahal, did you want to add? No, oh, I think you covered it, Mike. Okay. Um, well, here's a this is a very deep question from somebody who. Um, uh, you know, studies these things. I happen to recognize the name of the person, uh, which is if and I'm just going to read it. If storage dispatch differs depending on whether you're optimizing for market revenues versus clean peak standard certificate sales, does that imply some misalignment between the CPS structure and underlying market needs? That's a, that's a good question. Goes Nahal, to why your, don't you your optimization slide? If you want to pull that up, um, if if your if your optimization is on dispatch differs depending on whether you're going for market revenues or CPS certificates, is there a misalignment between the structure of the program and underlying market needs? Yeah, th thanks for that. And I think that's uh, slide 14 yeah. is a good one to to, to pull up. And Nahal, we'll let you start. Sure. No, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. 
Uh, I wouldn't say that is a structural mismatch. Uh, just, just in terms of clarification, uh, here on this slide, the purpose was just to elucidate the potentials uh, that can exist or one strategy or the other. So it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, Cream Peak uh, does not, uh, is not considered in strat, strat one here. Uh, yeah. it, the this this in this particular example, the storage is participating in multiple value streams, uh, such as uh, uh, frequency regulation or spinning reserves and uh, so on. So uh, uh, what is not seen in this chart is the pricing uh, for the other value streams and uh, the dispatch model that we use to uh, come up with this schedule essentially weighs uh, the economic opportunity of doing one over the other. So in the, in the example to the right, uh, the certificate price is assumed to be kept at ACP, so a high price, uh, so naturally you see uh, the battery uh, doing more of energy in those uh, clean peak hours compared to something else. Uh, it, may be, it may certainly be possible that uh, uh, high prices for energy and uh, certificates uh, can co coincide with each other, uh, but uh, the temporal scale over which those prices can vary uh, will be different, uh, one for a certificate and one for uh, just uh, wholesale market value streams. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And I would just uh, add that this is focusing on one eligible technology and the program was built to include uh, other eligible technologies and uh, focus on something different than uh, maximizing the revenue. But I think the program is designed to um, lower uh, cost uh, and emissions uh, and electricity uh, demand. Uh, uh, but there are some opportunity costs uh, for providing different services. Even though they may be stackable, uh, there may be some lost opportunity cost uh, potential. Um, but, but, but as Nehal said, uh, you, you know, a lot of times that there is alignment um, and, and uh, add, additivity or, 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 uh, between the different services. Great. Well, I think uh, we, uh, we're going to take time for one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. And, um, I saw a few people ask this question, and uh, I think some of the other uh, state folks, uh, state energy agency folks who have attended this webinar are, uh, are among those who are asking this, uh, which is this. It, it, it's a, the program seems very complex, and the question is, you know, could it be simplified? Is there a, a way that you could um, approximate this do something similar that that achieves maybe not all of all of the you know uh, goals, but but most of them or, or approximates them in a simpler way um, that is easier to develop and administer from the perspective of a of a state agency, for example. Yeah, I'll start that. And it's a little, bit of, it's a little bit of a setup question. asking you this question since you. Since you were involved in this in this program development, but I thought it, it's worthwhile asking. Right. No, I, I, I was going to make a comment on that, but but I have to admit, as a consultant, I, I like complexity, and uh, you know that, that that's what makes works so interesting. Um, but but in all honesty, I do think that some of these features can be simplified or removed. But I think then there's a trade-off, and and you would lose some other benefits uh, that they provide. So, so that I think is, is, the, is the simple answer. Um, I can't comment on which one is the most important or the least important uh, because there is interaction, but, but certainly it can be simplified, but I think then there would be some, you know, some, some trade-off. Jim or Nehal, did you want to add? No, no, I, I don't think a lot. I just, I, I mostly agree with what you had to say. Um, I think, yeah, I think with any of these programs, um, you know, and I think this is definitely true with, you know, DG programs that I'm involved in a lot is, uh, you know, there's a, there's often an urge to say, oh, well, let's make this simple. And then all of a sudden it's sort of less simple, you know, in reality than it, it turns out to be. I think there's often sort of a, 
you know, an idealized simple and then sort of the reality of simple is not so simple. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think another point too is that there's, you know, a lot of the complexity of this specific program was driven by the statute, you know, so there's a lot of particularly, you know, you know, the, 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 for, for example, the fact that there has to be seasonal peak periods, that's in the statute. The fact that there, you know, has to be an actual, or no, actually, that was not, I, I take it back. But the different categories, you know, for instance, were also in the statute. There was a fair amount of, like, very clear specification in the statute of how this would be done. So if there's, if you're a state agency and you're looking to do something different, I think, you know, and you have a mandate that's sort of a broader mandate, then yeah, it could be that there's there's more flexibility to work with there. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mike, Nihal, and Jim for your presentations. I want to thank uh, uh, Sandia National Laboratories and DOE Office of Electricity for their support. Um, we have uh, recorded this and it will be posted on the CISA website under the webinar archives within a few days if you want to review it. Um, slides will also be posted. And we have some upcoming webinars um, on the screen now, and, I, and I'll pass this back to Maria to make any closing remarks. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Again, thanks for all of our participants and our guest speakers. Um, please go to our website if you'd like to sign up for any of these upcoming webinars. Again, this will be recorded. Samantha is out, so you should all get a notification of the webinar recording and slides sometime in the middle of next week. And we look forward to having your participation on an upcoming event. Thanks, and have a great afternoon. With this, we're going to close out the webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.